Hello everybody. Welcome to the online lecture that you should see before you see the film We Shall Remain Trail of Tears for the next paper. Here are the six questions that relate to this. This is on paper three. Okay, so listen to this lecture, then watch the film. It's on YouTube. And for um, some chance it's not on YouTube, go ahead and Google it. It's in various places. We Shall Remain Trail of Tears. So this introductory lecture to the conquest and development of the West brings up the 19th century issue that was first and foremost in the minds of many, many Americans. Um, what do we do with Indians? This was the Indians, uh, the Indian question. What do we do with the First Amendment, uh, the First Americans? Whose land is it? Because as we know um, by this painting by John Gass in 1872, Americans just kept coming, right? We're making a lot of babies. A lot of folks were coming from Europe to escape economic and political hardships in Europe to come to the land of opportunity for them. And in this image, I think it's pretty powerful. You can see America symbolized by this woman with the loosely fit toga carrying tele telegraph wires and a school book going west. And in her, in front of her, running in front of her wake, are Native Americans and buffalo. We'll look at this more in class. So the Cherokee. Let me tell you their story. During the Revolutionary War, they took a chance. They sided with the British, and they lost. Um, and they lost U.S. land. I'm sorry. They lost land to the victorious United States. So they chose the wrong side during the Revolutionary War. During the War of 1812, which many call the Second American Revolution or Second American War of Independence, the British actually came up the Potomac River, burned down Washington, D.C. It's a fascinating story of how Dolly Madison, um, the First Lady, actually saved a portrait of Washington during the burning of the building. But during the War of 1812, the British invaded with Indian allies. Remember, many Native Americans chose to side with the British because they saw Americans as the one taking their land and they were taking the gamble to, hey, if we support the British, maybe we can keep our land in our ways. The U.S. fought the British with Indian alliances as well. Um, one of the most powerful allies the British had during the War of 1812 was Contum uh, Tecumseh's Confederacy. He actually successfully organized many different Indian peoples in what we call a pan-Indian alliance. It was one of the first time that Indians united against the white Americans coming west. Um, they embraced this idea of uh, no alcohol, right, and they rejected white religion. So they're trying to come up with a new pan-Indian identity. They allied with the British in the War of 1812, the Shawnee and others in the Confederacy. However, in the War of 1812, the Cherokee sided with the Americans. In fact, they fought with General Andrew Jackson in the southern part of the nation against the British. So the Cherokee succeeded, well, helped the United States defeat the British in the War of 1812. And you'll see in the film how the Cherokee continually say, hey, we're friends of the United States, we're longtime friends of the United States, and especially with Andrew Jackson. And this is where they, this is the historical grounds for that. As far as U.S. policy towards Native Americans, um, from the founding of our Native, from the 1780s to about 1830, in general, the policy was to try to turn Americans into Indian. I'm sorry, Indians into Americans. Doing this, this is the famous cover of the book, of the Alan Taylor American Colonies book. To do this. Men were to work in the fields, as was the gendered nature of work for European Americans, and women were to do the domestic work. Right? They also had American uh, representatives going into tribal lands and saying, hey, live in houses like this. Here's this brick, as you see in the background, a hybrid of European-style houses and indigenous-style houses. You see the conical one on the left. It's ironic that this guy is showing Cherokee, you know, had to grow corn, but Cherokee grow corn long before the um, Europeans came. In fact, the Cherokee and some civilized tribes, um, I'll show you who they are in a second, did in fact become Americans. They embraced many things American. In fact, a small portion of Cherokee wealthy folks, about 8 to 10 percent, actually owned slaves. 
How much more American in the American South could you be than to own slaves? You'll see this in the film. So the focus here is on the five civilized tribes. We call them civilized because they, they attempted in one way or another to become American. The Cherokee developed an alphabet. The Choctaw, the Choctaw allied and became longtime allies with the United States government against other Native American tribes, as did the Creek. The Creek were longtime U.S. government allies against Plains Indian tribes as the U.S. government moved west. But fascinatingly, um, the Cherokee are unique in the sense that they developed, they, this one guy, Sequoia, and then it spread throughout the tribe, developed a written language. They were an oral, um, an oral tradition. They passed down information, politics, knowledge, worldviews orally, as did most of the peoples in the Americas. However, he developed a written language, which is really interesting. And one of the first things he did uh, translate into the Cherokee alphabet were the Bible, and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. How much more American than that can you get? Here's the Lord's Prayer, right, done at the top in the Cherokee language. In the middle you see how to phonetically pronounce the Cherokee language. And at the bottom is the translation for the Lord's Prayer in Cherokee. For example, and listen to the how it's translated a little differently into the language. I'll give you a little piece. Our Father, heaven dweller, how will hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, let it make its appearance here upon earth take place. Thy will, the same as in heaven, it is done. It's just an interesting, you know, translation of the Lord's Prayer. Well, they have written language, what are they gonna do? What do Americans what's one of the number one ways Ameri number one things Americans were reading are newspapers. Right, so the Cherokee Phoenix published a newspaper both in English on the left-hand side and in Cherokee on the right-hand side. Check it out. Go ahead and Google the um, Cherokee Phoenix. Really super interesting, right? Once again, they are trying to become Americans. So how are they going to protect themselves? How are they going to do what other Americans are doing in developing territory, developing laws that govern themselves based on written law, like the Constitution is how the United States founds itself based on this, based on this written set of codices we share? Well, they made their own constitution, just like other states were doing at this same time, making their own constitution. How much more American can, um, can this be? So here it is, and look at they just kind of ripped it, cut and pasted, and added their, added some things to their constitution. Here's their preamble. We, the representatives of the people of the Cherokee Nation, in convention assembled in order to establish justice, ensure domestic, ensure tranquility, promote our common welfare, and secure to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of liberty, acknowledging with humility and gratitude the goodness of the sovereign ruler of the universe, in offering us an opportunity so favorable to the design and imploring his aid and direction in its accomplishment do ordain and establish this constitution for the government of the Cherokee Nation. It's interesting that, well, this is an interesting cut and pasting of the Cherokee Nation. Um, when Vietnam became a nation in the 20th century, they also cut and pasted from our Constitution and made it their preamble. Many, many new republics borrow from our Constitution. However, despite the fact that the Cherokee are trying to become American, trying, um, in fact, making a Constitution, converting to Christianity, not all the Cherokee, but a significant um, number of them, white Americans keep coming. White Americans want their land. And what, do, does, what really spurs many white Americans into Cherokee territory? Gold. Gold, is, was, gold was discovered in the headwaters of the rivers, on the mountaintops uh, that uh, boundary Georgia and the Cherokee Nation. Green is the Cherokee Nation at this time, and brown is the state of Georgia. So what happened? Um, now President, well, I'm sorry. President Andrew Jackson, before he became president, ran on one policy. His policy that he was going to remove the Indians from east of the Mississippi. This is a policy shift from trying to acculturate Indians into becoming Americans into getting rid of them. 
So this policy shift got him elected. And when you say, wait a minute, can one president uh, enforce such a thing? Of, um, can this whole checks and balances of our constitutional system make such a thing happen? Well, indeed, the Supreme Court decide, um, ruled in the 1820s something called the Doctrine of Discovery. So one of the three branches of our U.S. government, the Supreme Court, um, voted that voted the following, and they judged the following. The U.S. inherited authority over these lands from Great Britain, notwithstanding the occupancy of the natives who were heathens. To this day, this decision stands, and this is what, um, by law, gives the United States rule of the lands in North America. What had happened is a group of Native Americans took the United States government to court trying to um, argue that this land is inherently theirs. They had inherited from their, from for generations they had lived here. Well, the Supreme Court and said, nope, because the United States inherited these lands from Great Britain, therefore these lands are ours, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the natives who are heathens. Today, this court, this decision, this doctrine of discovery still stands. Um, so Andrew Jackson, he approaches the Cherokee Nation. And he says the following, and this is, this is an interesting piece of diplomacy between nations. Remember, it's the Cherokee Nation and the United States um, diplomatically trying to work out who's going to be occupying these lands in the southern Appalachians. Listen to what President Andrew Jackson tells them. Friends and, friends and brothers, by permission of the great spirit above and the voice of the people, I have been made the President of the United States, and now speak to you as your father and friend, and request you to listen. I don't think the Great Spirit above had anything to do with President Jackson getting elected. I think it was more the people, but I digress. Quote, Your warriors have known me long. You know I love my white and red children, and always speak with a straight, not a forked tongue. That I have always told you the truth. I now speak to you as my children, in the language of truth, listen. Where you are now, you and my white children are too near to each other to live in harmony and peace. Your game is destroyed, and many of your people will not work and till the earth. Beyond the great river Mississippi, where a part of your nation has gone, your father has provided a country large enough for all of you, and he advises you to remove to it. There your white brothers will not trouble you. They will have no claim to the land, and you can live upon it all, and all your children, as long as the grass grows or the water runs, in peace and plenty. It will be yours forever, for the improvements in the country where you live, where you now live, and for all the stock which you cannot take with you, your father will pay you a fair price. Where you now live, your white brothers have always claimed the land. Uh, not true. And the land beyond the Mississippi belongs to the president and no one else. He will give it to you forever. As you can imagine, the, the Cherokees living upon that land were astounded. What did they do? Some of them fought. Some of them fought with violence. Some of them just held up in the mountains. Others went to court. They had some friends from the north. They went to court. You'll see in the, this in the film. They actually succeeded in having the Supreme Court rule in their favor. Chief Justice John Marshall ruled for the Cherokee, arguing uh, the Cherokee Nation is going to be neither a state nor foreign nation, but a domestic dependent nation to be protected. Nobody knew what that meant. That was the first time in U.S. history something was called the domestic dependent nation. Remember, this is a young nation. We're making it up as it goes. President Jackson said to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, All right, Mr. Chief Justice, you made your decision. Now you enforce it. This is straight up President Jackson not abiding by the Constitution. It's the president's job to enforce the law. He's basically saying, screw it, I'm not going to do my job. Let Chief Marshall enforce it. The Supreme Court does have an army. It's called the army that is headed by the president. So this is a total breach of constitutional law. Nevertheless, the Trail of Tears led to um, the removal of 50,000 uh, P, uh, native peoples from the southeast. They were removed to the Oklahoma Territory. 16,000 died en route, which you'll see in the film. The U.S. government did give some money, about $5.6 million, to those who did settle in Oklahoma. So how could they get, how could the president get away with this? Well, 
he it was a very popular move because white Americans wanted the land in the southeast. It was very rich land, not to mention uh, there was a gold rush happening. And those who wanted it, those who supported it, were the, the cotton ba uh, the slave based cotton production. This is this is going to be the cotton boom in the 1830s. The um, pretty soon the U.S. is going to su surpass India as the number one producer of cotton for the bustling textile industry in Britain and elsewhere. Check out this steamer full of cotton. And this is this is going to be our liquid gold. I mean, this is going to be equal to what oil is now, or precious metals is. Um, it's a huge, huge industry for the United States. This is why he politically didn't, um, there was no political ramifications for what he did. In the 1850s, uh, cotton, text, cotton production and, and textile mills are our number one industry. So here, this is a Massachusetts textile mill producing cotton picked by slaves. It was one and all, right? It was the South producing cotton for the North based on slavery. The North is producing this textiles, making the United States very wealthy. This led to what historians call Alabama fever. And along with this, the uh, Eli Whitney invented the cotton engine, the cotton gin, which separated those little obnoxious seeds from the cotton in a much more efficient way than picking them out. And look at cotton boomed. Production up 300%, exports up 300%. By 1836, two-thirds of all our export were cotton or textiles. This is a boom. This is why nothing happened when the Cherokee, well, nothing politically, no political consequences happened when the Cherokee were removed. And look how the South grew. We think of the conquest and development of the West happening in the Plains or in California, but it also happened in the Southeast. Look in this map on, in, on the left in 1890. Right, the area, the white areas where native people still lived. Look at by 1830, slave-based cotton plantations had taken over. What's this going to lead to? Well, it's eventually going to lead to the bifurcation or the divi hardcore division between the slave South and the free North, and this is going to start to harden divisions, and eventually, this will lead to the Civil War because this, the South is going to be totally dedicated to slave-based um, labor. This is going to be a little postscript about what happens to the Cherokee, right? Remember how they were supposed to be given this territory for as long as the grass grows and the sun shines and the rivers flow and all that? Well, in 1887, the federal government, through the Dawes Act, put some Indian lands up for sale once again. Okay. And the Indian lands in Oklahoma to be up for sale were going to be up for sale on March 2nd, 1889. The Indian lands that was previously promised to them forever. So literally, um, guys on horses lined up at noon, March 2nd, 1889, when the gun went off, they were going to rush in and go claim the lands recently opened up in which the Indians were kicked off of. It's called the Oklahoma Land Rush. What happened is some of them snuck in or bribed their way in and got there sooner. This is why still to this day we know the Oklahoma college football team is the Oklahoma Sooners. They celebrate the fact that uh, some of their brethren got there sooner before the gun. Um, nevertheless, the Cherokee thrived in Oklahoma. I don't want to. I don't want to lessen the hardships they went through kick, being kicked off their land. But they developed one of the best coeducational systems in the nation. The, Cher the Cherokee survived and thrived, and still to this day, the Cherokee are um, a very important population in Oklahoma. Okay, the Western Cherokee. Here's a Cherokee woman. She's Marcia Pascal, the daughter of Colonel Pascal in Oklahoma in 1880. Okay, that concludes my lecture. Make sure you watch, and I hope you enjoy the film.